Everybody's socializing a little too steeply today. Welcome. Welcome to the April 25th, 26th meeting of the Rotary Club of Louisville. I am not Tony Kemper. No matter how much you look, we get confused for one another, I am not Tony Kemper. I am Barry Barker, president-elect of our club and executive director of TARC. And before we get into the invocation and so forth. September 22nd of 2017, Russell M. Coleman was sworn in as the United States Attorney for the Western District of Kentucky. As a U.S. Attorney, Russell is the Chief Federal Law Enforcement Officer for the Western District of Kentucky. The Western District encompasses 53 counties with a population of more than 2.2 million, including two military installations and four judicial divisions with courthouses in Louisville, Bowling Green, Paducah, and Owensboro. Russell has more than a decade of experience working in positions where he was engaged in state and federal law enforcement matters. He served as senior advisor and legal uh, counsel to U.S. Senator Mitch McConnell. Prior to his five years in Senator McConnell's office, Coleman served as special agent with the FBI and worked as briefing coordinator for two U.S. attorneys, uh, attorney generals in the U.S. Department of Justice. Most recently, Russell was in private practice as a partner with the law firm of Brown Todd, Frost Brown Todd from 2015 through 2017. He's also served as a volunteer assistant with the Commonwealth Attorneys in Kentucky 12th Judicial Circuit, Oldham Henry Trimble counties. He's been a member of the FBI Special Agents, uh, the Kentucky Nar Narcotic Officers Association, and the FBI Agents Association. Russell grew up in, in rural western Kentucky, graduating from Logan County High School. He received his under, undergraduate and his law degree from the University of Kentucky. I first met Russell in the 1996 legislative session on a late night. We were standing in the back of the Senate chamber as we spent a lot of time back there in, in the end of the legislative sessions. And um, we struck up a conversation and he appeared to be as much of a, a political junkie as, as I was. And he was only a sophomore at UK at that time. We decided that come the next session in 98, he would return and serve as my intern. So I had a great intern and I gained a friend and a friendship that's lasted over 20 years. So it's, it's a distinct honor for me to uh, introduce at this time our U.S. Attorney, Russell Coleman. Thank you, Senator K. Spear. I'm going to attempt this, uh, this lapel mic. Just flag me if it, it happens to go down. Uh, my name's Russell Coleman. I have the privilege for a period of years, I serve at the pleasure of the president, to serve that flag and to serve you. I, I very much appreciate Senator K. Spear's remarks. If you think back to earlier in your career, hopefully there was someone in your life, and I've been blessed with a few folks that sewed into you someone that was in a senior role, someone that spent time. I was a young, young hick from, from Logan County that was in the legislature for the first time, and this state senator was, was kind to me and actually talked to me as an intern. And so if you think back, those, those young people that you're sewing into, it has such a, a dramatic impact, and I'll always be grateful for, uh, for Senator, for Senator Casebeer and, and for your friendship. Uh, it's, Every Rotary is, you all have visited, most of you all Rotarians have visited a number of, of Rotary meetings in other states and, and in other cities in our Commonwealth. I've had the opportunity to, to visit one. My first speech as United States Attorney was to a Rotary group in Paducah. And it's not the accents that distinguish necessarily that meeting from this one. It, it, it's not even the view. It, we're near a river there too, uh, there in Paducah at that beautiful uh, Four River Center. Um, all you had to do was sip the tea. And what I mean by that is, when you go to the end of the line in Paducah, and you go to the big jug for the tea, I poured my glass of tea and then looked for the sweetener. There isn't sweetener, because the default in Paducah is sweet tea. Uh, around here, you gotta look for the sweetener, and so they call that a clue in my old profession as to, as to where you actually are. Uh, I was a little concerned, admittedly, about the subject matter that we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes. I was a little concerned that it would be too heavy. 
Uh, given the, the lightness of, of the day, we're, we're here immediately prior to Derby. But then I learned that your last two speakers focused on Frankfurt and the General Assembly. <laughs> and uh, this will be light fare, uh, comparatively. <laughs> I have a number of former colleagues from Frost Brown Todd in the room. I see other lawyers. Um, Mr. Cox is here to keep me on my toes from the criminal defense bar. A lot of lawyers in the room. There are folks married to lawyers, or some of you all have just endured lawyers in your family. But let me say this. There's a trick, the commonality. There are a few commonalities between lawyers, and that probably sets up another joke. But uh, there are a number of commonalities, things we learn in law school. Uh, in trial advocacy class, which is the class you take to speak to a jury or an audience to be persuasive, in trial advocacy class you're taught this concept of primacy and recency. It comes from psychology. Uh, psychological studies have shown that the human mind remembers the first thing that is said and oftentimes the last thing that is said during a presentation. The first thing and the last thing. And as a speaker, it's important for us to make that clear what is primacy and, and what is recency. So, so let me be very crystal clear on the front end and then I'll say something similar at the back end. I believe we live in an extraordinary city. I love Louisville. This is the city that my wife and I have chosen to raise our kids in. I'm from a rural area, so viewed Louisville through a, a skeptical lens for a long time, but love Louisville. Think this is an extraordinary place with amazing opportunity. And as I look around the room, I see people that are helping to facilitate those amazing opportunities. But as a city, we have a limiting factor or a limb fact, and I'll explain why that, that acronym. The limiting factor that we have for this city to attain the greatness that we know that it can, for us to compete, not only compete with our peer competitors of Nashville and Cincinnati and Indianapolis that we're always looking at, uh, Austin as, as Leadership Louisville and our other groups are looking at, not just that, but to achieve true greatness as a city, for our kids to want to come back here, to not continue to have a degree of brain drain. And that limb fact, that limiting factor is something you read about in the Courier Journal every day. It's something that you see when you turn on DRB or one of the, the, the local news stations. We have a significant violent crime challenge in this city in Jefferson County, and we have a significant opioid and drug epidemic problem. We come from the country, we are eat up with drug addiction in this county, and we are eat up with violent crime in this city. It is a limiting factor. And that term limb fact, some of you all may be familiar with General McChrystal, who commanded the Joint Special Operations Command, is an extraordinary warrior, um, had written a book, great leadership book, for many of you all who, who lead groups called Team of Teams. And he talks about what a limiting factor is. And a limiting factor is an obstacle, whether it be a characteristic we have or don't have, a skill we don't have, whether it be a personnel issue in a company, or in the case of the brief time I served in Iraq, and what he talks about in the book, is a limiting factor. We weren't fast enough, we weren't nimble enough as a military to eliminate the, the terrorist threat at one time in Iraq. And so he, he provides a number of examples of limiting factors, and he talks about every organization can have limb facts, can have limiting factors. And so the limiting factor, again, as I, as I indicated, is violent crime and drug addiction in this city. So let me, in a nutshell, I, I went to law school to avoid math, but let me just give you a, a quick sketch of what this what this violent crime challenge looks like for the city. And I'm not gonna get into the weeds, there's a lot of data out there. I was culling through some of it this morning so I could maybe distill it down into a few data points for you to take away. Between 2014 and 2016 in Jefferson County, our homicide rate increased 110%. 110% increase in murders in our city between 14 and 16. We are a city that, that was known as one of the safest in the United States. That was part of our competitive advantage, comparative advantage as we pitched companies and others to come to this city. We were known as a, a, a safe city. We endured, and, and this is not acceptable, but we endured typically around 50 homicides a year, 50 murders a year in Jefferson County. And I'm not saying that's great, but on, a, a, as far as a city, that kept us on the, uh, it was viewed as on the safe end of the spectrum nationally. Our average now is over 100 homicides in this city a year. Last two years, we've, we've had over 100 homicides a year. We've had close to 30, 27 this year, and we're not even into the season where crime picks up when it, when it warms up. So we're, we're on tap to exceed that, exceed that again. On the drug epidemic front, we lose one Jefferson Countyan 
one member of our family, one member of our church, one member of our mosque, a, one a day to drug-related death in Jefferson County. We lose one person a day to overdoses. Now, that's, n that's not even getting into the number of overdoses we're enduring in, in Jefferson County. So, so one a day, 1,404 last year in our Commonwealth, but Jefferson County played a significant role in that, one a day. So I, I've, I've given you a dark picture of what we're enduring. I'm probably talking to someone, many someones whose families have experienced addiction, whose families have experienced violent crime. Addiction doesn't know a zip code. Addiction doesn't stop at Nice Street. Addiction doesn't stop at Broadway going to Smoketown, nor does violent crime. So what's the solution? Let me just say on the front end, there's, there's a stereotype, and I, I am pleased to serve as U.S. Attorney. Oftentimes this role is referred to as the Chief Federal Law Enforcement Officer for the district in which I serve. I, I, I want to avoid the stereotype of the feds being viewed as rolling in on a white horse. Anything I'm going to talk about as the solution is a true collaboration between federal, state, and local here in this city. I'm extremely proud that the solution that I'm going to discuss with you for a minute, and I am convinced with your help, which is frankly the most important aspect of anything I'm going to talk about, with your help can help mitigate this. I'm committed to that. This is this, what I'm talking about is a true partnership. Real quick, uh, some of you all, Mr. Cox and others may have dealt with it. Mr. Cox certainly dealt with the U.S. Attorney's Office. You, you know what it is, you, you, you have a sense. I, I, am, I run an office of about 40 prosecutors. We're tasked with enforcing federal law for a district that runs from Oldham County down to Fulton and Hickman. 53 counties we're responsible for to enforce federal law. It's about two and a half million people that we serve out of our office. Uh, we have an office in Bowling Green, an office in Owensboro, just an office, no actual people there, and a couple of prosecutors, and I'm, I'm dedicated to building the office in Paducah so that we can have an impactful role in the purchase, which we've ignored, frankly, I think, from a federal law enforcement perspective for, for far too long. Uh, quick history lesson and, and a takeaway. The founders of our republic designed law enforcement to essentially be a state and local matter. Policing as the founders envisioned it, is a state and local matter. So why is a Fed up here talking about solutions if the founders thought it would just be a state and local matter? In, in the Constitution itself, there are only three crimes, piracy, counterfeiting, and uh, treason. And we don't do a lot of prosecuting of any three of those. <laughs> what, what happened? But why is many of our vision of law enforcement, FBI raid jackets and, and black vehicles and, and sometimes helicopters, the, the fact is, that government caught up with society. The Department of Justice, in which I serve, has only been around since, since 1870. The Attorney General has been around since the founding of our republic. The first U.S. Attorney, my first predecessor for Kentucky, was appointed by George Washington in 1789. But until 1870, we didn't have a DOJ. And the Department of Justice was created to enforce Reconstruction. Department of Justice was created so that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments would be enforced so that African Americans who had been treated as possessions could be citizens of our country. That's why the Department of Justice was created to enforce 13, 14, and 15th Amendment. And technology evolved. The automobile allowed bad guys to go from one jurisdiction to the other. The computer provided force multipliers. Technology evolved, so Congress vastly expanded the federal criminal statutory role. So our agencies, the FBI itself was only created in 1908. Agents weren't allowed to carry guns legally until the 1930s. So you see this, these entities that we're now familiar with, these acronyms in the Department of Justice, haven't been around a long time. So what, what is the solution? I just wanted to give you a quick primer on who it is I am and, and who it is our, our entity itself, a bit of our history. Um, another concept from Iraq, and I'm, I'm loath to bring that here because I don't want the connotations to be negative, but what we did during beginning in, in 07 in Iraq to ultimately be successful was, was known as clear, hold, and build. We would go in and we would take out those that were doing the killing, those, the bad guys that were harming families. Hold, that territory would, would then be held and build. Faith-based institutions and nonprofits and businesses would build something to fill that void. Remember that concept, clear, 
hold and build. My role as United States Attorney, Chief Conrad's role as Chief of the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department and, and my colleagues at the FBI, the ATF, the DEA, our role is to clear. Our role is to take out the worst of the worst that are bringing drugs into this community, the significant drug trafficking organizations. Our job is to take out the gangs that are, drive, are a large driver of our homicides. Chief Conrad is, is on record saying we have between 20 and 30 gangs in this city alone. They're driving much of the homicide. They're driving much of that number being over 100 of our fellow civilians who are losing their lives. You know, it's, it's easy to describe this problem in, in terms of, of numbers, uh, but in, until you look in some of these victims' eyes, I, I'll give you a name and then I'm gonna get into the solution of, of, of how we're gonna address this. Dequante Hobbs, a name that some of you all may be familiar with. Dequante was a, a seven-year-old living in West Louisville. Uh, it was uh, the, just past the eve of his seventh birthday. He was eating birthday cake on a Sunday night. And he was sitting at the kitchen table doing what our kids do, playing on a tablet, eating birthday cake. And there was an altercation in the street outside his house, unrelated to, to DeQuante or his mom, and a few rounds were cranked off. One of those hit young DeQuante, who then crawled across the floor to get to his mom, who was also crawling towards her son, because just like tactically, I learned in the FBI Academy, when you, when you live in these communities that are facing violence to the degree that we are, you know tactically that you hit the ground when you hear gunshots. That's how some of our fellow Louisvillians live. Not all that far, and what they contend with, not all that far from where we are. So the solution, clear, hold, and build. I'm from the country, and so I'll, I'll simplify this. What you're gonna hear, and I haven't talked to the press about this, but what you're gonna hear from the podium in my office, and you've heard some thus far, is essentially a three-legged stool. One of those legs is every few months we will be rolling out a large package of gun indictments, taking guns off the streets, focusing on those felons who have those guns, who have significant criminal histories, so that we can take those, those guys off the streets. We have significant tools in our federal toolkit that simply aren't available at the state level. My colleague Tom Wine, our phenomenal Commonwealth attorney, doesn't have these mandatory minimum tools. He doesn't have an ability to eliminate uh, parole. We don't have that at the federal system. He oftentimes doesn't have the ability with some of our judges at the state level to immediately detain, and we have that at the federal level. Those are tools in our toolkit. So every few months, you're gonna see us release names of significant package of gun indictments. That's gonna keep rolling forward. I did that last month, we're gonna be doing that towards the end of May. At the same time, and we're gonna demonstrate that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, at the same time we're aggressively investigating these organizations, these gangs, seeking enterprise, enterprise prosecutions, using tools that some of you all may have heard but not, not, not realize what they are, tools like RICO. You've heard the term RICO. It's a statute that gives us significant authority. You hear it in terms of organized crime if you watch real crime shows. A statute that allow us to go after the gang as an entity, as an entity, not simply individuals, but as an entity. So while we're rolling out these gun indictments, we're also building gang prosecution efforts. Our prosecutors are embedded with, just to give you an example, you'll oftentimes hear the 9th Mobile Division of LMPD, just some amazing officers that are, that the lines between the feds, the states, and the locals have been eliminated. I, I have a couple of prosecutors, assistant United States attorneys who are embedded with that Louisville Metropolitan Police Department unit to build cases against the significant organizations. So that's the second leg of the stool. The third leg of the stool is to do what we've been doing for quite a while, and that is go after the drug traffickers, the large entities. We're going after those that bring significant amounts of meth, methamphetamine and heroin, and fentanyl into this community. So that's the three-legged stool on the enforcement side. And, and that's an effort, I wanna be mindful of my time, that, that's an effort that is not simply the feds riding in on a white horse. That's an effort that is federal, state, and local. Uh, in law enforcement, you, you hear law enforcement executives talk about they need more resources, and that's always at the, at the tip of the spear. But I would say one of the most significant limiting factors in law enforcement that limits our success is what it says on your badge. You don't, we don't cooperate well with other agencies. FBI doesn't work with DEA, doesn't work with ATF, and I know I'm giving you a bunch of acronyms, but the, the, the entities are siloed. To be successful, 
to bring those numbers down in this community, we're eliminating those silos. You, you can't tell when you walk into a squad bay when these individuals are working on cases what agency they necessarily work for. They're working together, they're rowing together for you and, and, and for our family. So I'm, I'm really excited about that effort. You're gonna see and hear a lot more of that this year. But frankly, that's even with my limited time, that's not the most significant point I wanna raise with you. Clear, hold, and build. The holding comes from community policing efforts and our faith-based groups getting involved and nonprofits getting involved. And frankly, that's, that's not a job. We're very, very good as prosecutors at the clear part. The hold part is, is not our role. But I'll tell you, the most significant component of all of this, the, frankly, the most significant challenge is the building. And I'm looking at a lot of people in this community, some of whom are already engaged in that building, because we can go hard and we will go hard against the worst of the worst. And this is not mass roundups. This isn't large numbers. This is being smart. This is looking at those at the top. This is taking out the trigger pullers. This is not putting cuffs on large numbers of individuals. It's being smart. We're going to be good about that. And as long as I'm U.S. Attorney, I'm going to be proud to be aggressive in working with my colleagues to, to address those numbers. But we don't do the building. We're a band-aid. We can go as aggressively as possible and we're not going to eliminate the systemic challenge that is continuing to kill our fellow, fellow Louisvillians. There are significant challenges in job training and mentorship and providing job placement. There, there, are, there are such deficits in some of our neighborhoods that as I look around I see efforts I see Senator K. Spear with Louisville Visual Arts and Alice Bridges and I were talking about the, the effort to build new headquarters, a passport in the West End. Uh, there, there, are, there are those that are, are, are aggressively attempting to provide opportunity, but frankly, we have to scale up. I know this Rotary has done a phenomenal job in Western High School and Iroquois High School with your mentorship program. You know, how, how do you eat an apple one bite at a time? And by reaching out and by mentoring, you're engaging. But the scope of this problem is far beyond our degree of engagement thus far. You know it because you read about it. And I think sometimes it's, it's challenging to figure out, okay, there's a problem, it's been framed out. How do I engage? How do I get into that building piece? There are organizations that are doing phenomenal work. Some of those I mentioned. Uh, Sadiqa Reynolds with the Urban League are doing, so they're doing some amazing things. They put 251 people in, in jobs. They're doing job placement. Uh, there, there are, there are faith-based organizations that are starting to engage and engaging uh, in the West End and in the South End uh, that, that, are, that are starting to realize the, the scope of the challenge. But I'm looking at business leaders and medical professionals and I'm looking at people that care, Dr. Babar, deeply, deeply because they demonstrate this about this community. So I, I don't bring solutions on the build front. I bring problems. And is everyone here knows the scope of that problem, and we won't arrest our way out of it. I, we're not attempting to arrest our way out of it. We're attempting to make that space to allow building, to allow that degree of, of building to occur. So a lot of business leaders in here, a lot of, a lot of folks that are proud of, of their city. Let me share an anecdote, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up. I had lunch recently with a, a member of our federal judiciary, prestigious judge here in, in Louisville, with a couple of his law clerks. And these, these clerkships are, are sought after and, and folks come, law, young lawyers come from all over the country to clerk for a federal judge. And so I was having, having lunch with a couple of these federal judges and very well educated, both Harvard graduates, they probably didn't understand anything I said. Uh, they, very sharp folks. And it, at one point, one of the law clerks who was from California, who had Harvard Law School and he came from a prestigious a law firm elsewhere, started talking about his conversation with his dad as he was telling his dad that he was coming to Louisville for this amazing career opportunity. And he, he started to tell his dad and, I, and he began to articulate his dad's response. And I knew what was going to come next. It was going to be bourbon, it was going to be horses, maybe the derby specifically, or it was going to be, it was going to be basketball. And so this dad, in, in, in a tough and I, won't, I, won't, I don't want to mention specifically where I was, a tough area in California, this dad talking to his, the, the type of young person we want to be incenting and bringing here and tapping into their intellectual ability and having them as our employees and having them build businesses and create jobs. He was talking to this individual and he said, oh, Louisville, isn't that a dangerous city? 
But we can't make policy based on anecdotes. Um, but that angers me. I'm not from here. I know there are a lot of native Louisvillians, and I didn't go to high school here, and so I, I can't give that secret handshake. Um, but I, I love this city, and this is where I'm choosing to raise my kids. Um, th that just makes me angry, and it demonstrates what we're facing. The major city chiefs, it's a, uh, a group of police chiefs from the largest cities in the United States, ranked Louisville initially as the 11th most dangerous city in the United States last year. And I said that once, speaking to a leadership Louisville group, and Chief Conrad, who's a member, corrected me. Uh, he said the numbers were off, and we were actually, we we're the 24th most dangerous city in the United States. Um, and I deeply respect Chief Conrad. He's a great partner. But that's unacceptable to me. This is my hometown. It should be unacceptable to everyone in this room. I'm blessed to have the opportunity for a short period of time to address one component of destroying that narrative. The clearing. The people in this room are uniquely equipped to address the building portion. So please talk to Urban League, talk to some of the people I mentioned. There isn't, your mentorship program, look at scaling it up, look at other schools. There are so many things that can be done to try to mitigate this violence because, and the addiction, because I can't do it and the wonderfully talented folks I work with, career prosecutors, can't do it. We can address a component of it this Rotary and those that work for you and those that you engage with in this community, I mean, I'm talking to a bunch of force multipliers, have the ability to do the building. So, folks, primacy and recency. We live in an extraordinary city. I'm preaching to the choir on that one. I'm talking to a bunch of Rot Rotarians in Louisville. We live in an amazing city. I'm, I'm so proud to be here, to live here, to raise my kids here. But we have a limiting factor that's going to limit the city's greatness. And I, we've talked about it. I can do a portion, I'm blessed to work with folks that can do a portion of addressing that limiting factor. A lot of it rests on you. So thank you for the privilege of spending some time with you and thank you for the opportunity. Questions? Russell, thank you for your service on behalf of the citizens of Kentucky. Uh, my name is Tracy Holliday. I run a local nonprofit that's on the build side of the equation. But my uh, question has to do with there's a lot of passion right now in Washington <coughs> for increased spending, particularly in the military area. What's been happening with your budgets, uh, particularly in light of, I know there's been some special funding for opioid crisis issues and whatever, but on a local scale right now where you work in the budget you have to manage, is it increasing, decreasing, staying the same? Well, thank you for the question, Mr. Polly, and thank you for the kind words. I'm pleased to say that I was on a call yesterday with a group that had just met with my boss, the Attorney General, looking at our budget allocation. The question was, and it's very important, because oftentimes budget determines policy, and I'm talking to a bunch of business owners, you, you know that. Budget determines how many prosecutors I can hire. It, it allows my ability to either limit my force multiplier effect or, or increase it. Uh, the Department of Justice has received the largest allocation that it's enjoyed in, since 1959, apparently. And so much of DOJ's budget is personnel. Much of it goes to people, employing prosecutors and paralegals and assistants. Um, it, it was announced to us that there are 500 new assistant U.S. attorney positions being funded. A lot of those are in around the border area in immigration. But about 200 of those are going to be violent crime prosecutors. Those are folks that, in an office that I have 37 prosecutors, if I'm able to add one or two more assistant U.S. attorneys, what I can do, what we can do for this community with a couple more AUSAs, and so I'm, I'm literally praying that we get a couple of those, 160, I've petitioned for those, and so I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunities. As it was said on that call yesterday, because of these resources, it's a great time to be a United States attorney, and I, I agree, and it was a great question. I appreciate it, sir. Well, and one thing on the, on the opiate, so that, that, that is on the violent crime side, we're, we're seeing Congress has set aside 600 billion, 600 B, to address opiate issues. That hasn't been spent yet. Massive amount has been set aside, and it's unclear what that will be used for on the enforcement side, but as we know, drug addiction is a Gordian knot. There's a law enforcement piece to that, there's a prevention piece, there's an education piece, there's a huge treatment piece that we're, we're addressing about 10% of those that need treatment in the Commonwealth with treatment. So we, we got a long way to go there. And so there's a significant pot of money. 
And so those of you that follow public affairs, those of you that stay engaged, keep an eye on how that money is spent and advocate for how that money should be spent. I'm looking at, at, at Julie from KET. If you all haven't looked at some of the things that KET has done around opiate addiction in the Commonwealth, uh, from town halls to interviews to spending time in Eastern Kentucky that's particularly hard hit, look at KET and some of the opiate work they've done. Um, I would love to see some of that money come to education efforts as well. Um, I, one last, somewhat of a non sequitur, but it's important. It's one thing I, I never leave, a, and sir, I, I, will, I apologize, I, one no. second. I never leave a venue without saying, on, on one hand, I have from Oldham County down to the river counties, one of those counties looks a little different if you look at the drug threat. The only county where I would say opiates are the most significant killer and issue is here in Jefferson County. So we, Jefferson County looks a lot more like the mountains, a lot more like northern Kentucky than any of the other 52 counties I serve. Methamphetamines, is the, meth is the primary drug we deal with in all those counties, and meth is also the primary drug we deal with in Jefferson County. It's just not the killer because of the nature of meth and the, the nature of opiates. But the one thing, I, I never leave any audience. I've spoken to eighth graders this week and I've spoken to, to a, a couple of other groups, a little older, the eighth graders were the scariest. Um, when we were growing up, we watched these commercials, this is your brain on drugs, and the eggs were cracked, and we made fun of those, and Saturday Night Live did parodies, might have been a little overkill. We exist in an environment, and there are a lot of folks with kids, we exist in an environment where the margin of error with drug use now is non-existent. We exist in an environment where one of our kids goes to a party, and we say, now nah, our kids would never do that. Let me pause on that, because we're, we prosecute and I have prosecutions and deal with parents who said their kids, their kids would never do that. One pill, sampling one pill that's actually fentanyl, that's actually some uh, synthetic, can kill our kids. They think it's a, it's a uh, Percocet. They think it's something to play with. They think they know what they're dealing with. One pill can kill. So the margin of error on sampling drugs is zero now. We're seeing addicts that start as early as 11 and 12. And so if you're thinking, I'll talk to my kids when they get to middle school or get a little bit older, that's too late. We have to have these uncomfortable conversations with our kids now because there's zero margin of error, folks, and look what's at risk. So, sir, I've kept you waiting for a long time. I'm sorry. No, everything you're saying is very important. My name is Larry Sloan. I turn that on, Mr. Sloan. I'll, I'll repeat his question if you want to go ahead, sir. I can, I can speak loud and louder. My name's Larry Sloan, and I'm glad you're here today. I'm Thank glad you. to know you live here. Good. Thank you. Uh, my question is this. Uh, the county jail here, Metro County Jail, is overloaded usually. It's the largest detox center in the state. Where do the people that you're going to be going after when they go to jail? And how is your effort to get those people connected to the opioid, opioid <laughs> crisis? So thank you, sir. I appreciate it. The question was, we're, Metro Corrections is overloaded. Uh, where are the folks that, that those that we are charging and are detaining, where are they going to go? On the front end, and I, it's presumptuous for me to say so, but Mark Bolton is the director, director of Corrections for Jefferson County. He is doing some amazing work on detox, on reentry. I would encourage you, if, if not to have him as a speaker, engage with him, sit down and talk to him. He, he's just doing some incredible stuff on the back end. Uh, I would just encourage you to, to take a look at that. None of our detainees uh, go to Metro Corrections. Uh, they, they simply don't have the space for those that we are, we are charging. They go to, to jails out in the Commonwealth uh, who are then compensated for having federal, federal prisoners. So that, that's not an issue when it comes to the overcrowding, overcrowding here. Thank you for your service. Uh, Riggs Lewis, Norton Healthcare. Yes, sir. Uh, have you had an opportunity to look into the, the, the follow-on effect of opioids? Uh, Kentucky is now the leader in hepatitis C. Uh, Senator Adams at the state level is now mandatory, they have a mandatory screening of all uh, mothers and all the hospital systems are starting to do that. But we're now the number one and in, in West Virginia is number two in hepatitis C outbreaks. Is that something you're all looking at? It, I know it's a health care piece, but it is a follow-on to the opioid epidemic. The, the Gordian knot is about the best metaphor I can think of to look at the drug addiction challenge. Uh, we aren't going to arrest our way out of it. Uh, we, we can't, as, as law enforcement officials, we can't address it. Uh, healthcare alone can't address it. We help, law enforcement can incentivize oftentimes treatment, but we can't fully address it. We can 
address supply, we can't address demand. So the, the, the question went to a, a, a healthcare component. I spent a number of years working for, for Senator McConnell and was, was pleased to do that. Senator McConnell liked to spoke, quote one of your previous speakers, Mr. Jones. He said Mr. Jones taught him that the most important word in the English language is focus. And so what, what I try to do in my limited time as U.S. Attorney is, is focus on the enforcement piece. I, I, I like to talk, I try to engage and talk about the other healthcare components of this and be aware of them. But our job as prosecutors is to prosecute. Uh, we, we work with prevention, we work with treatment, but our job is to prosecute effectively, ambitiously, and aggressively, and that's what we're focused on. So I appreciate your question, though. This is the last question. I'm sorry I didn't hear that it was the last Yeah, it, was. it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> Just a simple question. Yes, sir. The budget that you're presently operating under, the total amount of money, total, all, all expenses considered, compared with the last year and the year before that, are you lower or higher? So we're significantly higher, and I don't have the final numbers yet, but I, I mentioned a, a statistic that we received last night, and that is our, the Department of Justice's allocation is the most significant it has been for many, many, many years. No, I mean here. I don't, have our, I don't have our numbers yet, but the, the presumption is because the Department of Justice's budget is higher, the individual United States Attorney's offices will benefit from that as well. Well, compared with the one that you're operating under and the last two years, are so you higher or lower? Significantly up is what I anticipate. Okay. Okay, let's give it up for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So appreciate it. We've got, we've got the What is Rotary table outside, just outside here. And stay and enjoy sitting on the dock of the bay by the rocking Rotary Band. Thank you all.